And this is the clerk with a courtesy announcement that this meeting is now broadcast live on our web portal and YouTube channel. Hi, Brian. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Yeah. So Are you welcome in the clinic to, today? Yes, I, I wish I want to know more about your program too. After maybe we can keep in touch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but well, I'll send you an email with, and we can get a conversation started. Yeah, so great. Yeah. Good afternoon, Paul. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, loud and clear. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Sapria. Yes. Hello, we can hear you loud and clear. Have a great meeting. Okay, let me see. My video won't turn on. Good afternoon, Chairperson Simidian. You are muted, sir. I was asking if I was coming through loud and clear because we're using a new microphone system. We can hear you, thank you. Great, thank you so much. And yes. I see uh, we're not yet live, is that correct, Rhonda? We are live, sir. Ah, we are, all right, thank you very much. Well, we will start in just about 30 seconds, everybody, so hang in. Thank you, and your clerk this afternoon will be Jess Jamison. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much for joining us today. This is the Santa Clara County Health and Hospital Committee. I'm County Supervisor Joe Simidian, and I uh, am serving as chair of the committee this year. Uh, the first item of business is to call the roll and establish the presence of a quorum. So we will ask the clerk to uh, call the roll, establish the presence of a quorum. Recording in progress. Vice Chairperson Lee. Lee present. Chairperson Simidian. Here. Thank you very much. The presence of a quorum having been established. 
we will uh, move on to the regular agenda for this special hearing. And I want to thank all of you who are joining us and participating today. Uh, this special hearing is designed to address the issue of long COVID, and it is uh, restructured slightly with that end in mind. For those of you who are regular participants, you will note that our agenda has first special hearing where we'll hear from panelists that I'll introduce in a moment. We will then ask for comment on the item at the end of the item, uh, meaning after we've heard from our two panels and after there's been some question and answer with Supervisor Lee and myself. And then we will take the thing we call public comment, which is the opportunity to comment on non-agendized items and make that the last order of business <coughs> for our committee today. The plan in terms of timing is to spend the time between now and, um, oh, I'd say four o'clock uh, on the two panels, so roughly 45 minutes for each. Uh, then at four o'clock, we will uh, try and make sure we wrap up expeditiously, but then take comment from members of the public on uh, long COVID, today's topic, and then take public comment as well on non-agendized items. So I hope that's clear to one and all, and we'll see when we get there how many folks we have with uh, comments at that time. Let me begin uh, by uh, welcoming and thanking our panelists for the first panel. Uh, we have with us Dr. Brian Block, and Dr. Block, if you would just raise your hand so we can uh, identify you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. Uh, and Dr. Block uh, is joined by uh, Dr. Hector Fabio Bonilla. And uh, let me ask Dr. Bonilla, am I pronouncing your last name correctly, Dr. Bonilla? No problem. You did right. Thank you. Thank you. And then finally, we have uh, with us uh, Emily Huff, uh, who is also with us today. And uh, Dr. Uh, Block is with UCSF, University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Benia is uh, at uh, Stanford Medicine. And Ms. Huff is with us from uh, Brown University uh, at the moment, although she is ordinarily assigned, as I understand it, to the National Health Service in uh, Great Britain. So thank you all three for being here with us Today, I will introduce our second panel uh, after we have wrapped up the conversation with uh, this first panel. And I want to begin with um, my thanks, as I said earlier, as our county has dealt with the day-to-day -day crises of the pandemic over the last year and a half, almost two years now, we have been obliged to deal with the urgent uh, necessities of the moment, but we've also been obliged to think a little bit longer term about where are we headed and what are the longer term consequences, hence uh, the topic of today's special meeting. Uh, so I have a, a series of questions. Uh, Supervisor Lee, I'm going to just start by trying to introduce this issue uh, with uh, questions directed to Dr. Block, Dr. Mania, and Ms. Huff. And so let me start with Dr. Block and say, Dr. Block, what is long COVID? Just uh, lay that out for us, if you would, please. Great. Well, thank you for that opening question. And thanks for inviting me to share with you all today. So what we know about people who have coronavirus is that they can have an acute infection and then we hope for them to recover and get better. And what our experience has taught us in taking care of patients is that it's very normal to have persistent symptoms that last a couple of weeks, even up to a month or two after their initial infection. So I want to say first that that is not long COVID. And if you have persistent symptoms that last for a couple of weeks to a couple of months, you could still end up having a complete recovery and be what we would consider a normal trajectory for someone recovering from acute COVID. Now, what we've also recognized is not everyone does follow that path and make a complete recovery after a couple of months. And so what we now describe as long COVID is a syndrome of persistent symptoms that last for more than a couple of months and, be, and have to persist beyond two or three months after the initial infection. And what people most often are reporting is problems with their breathing, problems with cognitive function, problems with other aspects of their physical function. And we know that this can be a multi-system disease that can present in various ways and kind of can be a little bit different in each person who's experienced. So the summary is long COVID is persistent symptoms after a COVID infection, and it has to be quite persistent. So not just a couple of weeks, but more on the order of many months after the initial infection. All right. And then let me ask Dr. 
Rania, uh, what, what would you add, if anything, to that description of long COVID? If you were standing at a cocktail party and somebody said, hey, I've got your attention for a few minutes here, what's long COVID? What else would you share? Yeah, one thing is it's important to know, this is nothing new. If you look at the prior coronavirus infections, like a SARS and MERS, they can have similar symptoms after the people recoil for the acute infection. The other thing is, I want to just to a point for studying those people, we need to have some definitions. Like when do you define is long COVID and when is not? So it's not clear, but the CDC already decided like a, more than 28 days after the infection, we can see a long COVID. Uh, the National Institute of Healthcare and Excellence from the UK, they define it, define like a more than 12 weeks of the symptoms because they noted like a many people, the symptoms result after. So there are two things I want to point. And the other thing that's kind of interesting is what the implication of this kind of illness. So the biggest analysis studies about the prevalence in the community of this kind of problem have been reported around 1.5% of the population overall. But when we're looking for in the population with COVID, so the studies show between 30 to 70% depends if the people have been in the hospitals and outpatient. But long COVID can be appeared even after they have a mild condition. Does it means you need to have a severe COVID infection being in the hospital in ICU on the vein to develop this kind of problem. We see people with a very mild symptoms of COVID last for a few days and the people a month or two months later, they start to develop symptoms that involve many organs or many organ systems and uh, not only pulmonary. Uh, interesting, this kind of uh, uh, concern start with the critical care doctors and pulmonologists when they see people on the fence and after they came out from the fence, they end up with residual problems. But later on, we find out that those people have other problems different than pulmonary symptoms. Understood then. And so let me ask Ms. Huff, who I understand comes at this from a system standpoint. Ms. Huff, so we've heard from Dr. Block and Dr. Bonilla the, you know, the sort of clinical definition of what long COVID <clears throat> is. What should our systems be doing to rest respond to what is a still emerging phenomenon? Yeah, thank you. So I think it's, um, I think there are a few things that health systems can be doing at the moment. I mean, the first is um, potentially making sure that they've got the right services to support patients and, um, it's still emerging what those look like, but generally speaking, I would say they're kind of multidisciplinary uh, services to support people because the range of symptoms that people might be experiencing are quite varied. So um, how do they make sure that people can get access to um, treatment where they need it? I think given that this is such a new um, uh, condition as well, the other thing that it's important for our health services to be doing is engaging in uh, research and education to share their insights, to um, share what they're finding, to be open to kind of new technologies and, and new ways of, um, of, of treating and supporting people and contributing to research agendas. Um, and I think the third thing I would highlight is that, um, you know, one of the other th things that's going to be remain really important is thinking about prevention and continuing to encourage people to get vaccinated, to stay safe, uh, and to try and avoid catching COVID in, in the first place. And Ms. Huff, not to make light at all, but in all seriousness, it sounds like what you've just said is the best way to avoid long COVID is to avoid COVID altogether, which means get yourself vaccinated, yes? I would say so. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, let me go back to Dr. Bonilla, if I may, uh, and, and, and then to Dr. Block and ask. So Dr. Bonilla, Dr. Block, beginning with you, Dr. Bonilla, so what is Stanford uh, doing to address the, uh, the needs of its patients with respect to long COVID? And then uh, same question about UCSF uh, for you, Dr. Block, but starting with Dr. Bonilla, uh, so what is the response uh, at uh, the Stanford Healthcare Systems in terms of the emerging prevalence of uh, or, uh, long COVID, Dr. Benia? Dr. Benia, forgive me, you're still muted, sir. There we go. So we, we found out I was part of the a clinical trial for uh, therapeutics as an outpatient. 
And we find out many people after they finish the clinical trial still remain with symptoms. So we cannot concern and we have a conversation and see what are going to, what are going to do with these kind of problems. So my division of infection diseases and as well as the Department of Medicine uh, through the complex diseases, we have a conversation and see what thing we're going to do. So we create a clinic they call we call the past clinic and this past clinic is like a, a group of physicians that include two infection diseases one primary care doctor that we evaluate those people try to assess what kind of organ system those people have and we have a cooperation with a different colleague for different kind of groups cardiologists rheumatologists neurologists so all together so we evaluate and we refer to these patients to the appropriate uh, doctor. In this way, we can cooperate one try to understand the problem and through that to figure out potential therapeutics. And at this point, we don't have no standard therapies. We try some drugs and some people have been working, other ones not. But this is a very complex disease that people can present only with a cardiac problems, respiratory problems, or neurological conditions. So we need a multidisciplinary approach try to address those issues. We have already close to 100 patients in our cohort, and we're planning maybe to keep on enrolling patients, uh, maybe for until we have more in the, better understanding of these kind of conditions. As well as we are talking with groups around the country, try to get some consensus about how uh, approach this kind of illness, what kind of diagnostic tool we needed, and what kind of potential therapeutics we're going to have for those patients. Thank you. Dr. Benia, it, just because I'm taking notes rapidly, did I hear you correctly saying something like 100 patients in the clinic at this point? Yes, you're correct. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Block, what's your experience at UCSF, uh, and how are you approaching uh, this same yeah. uh, need uh, or set of needs? Yeah, so I think we have a very similar approach that's modeled on the multidisciplinary and interprofessional approach to caring for people who have a lot of needs across different parts of their body and different organ systems. So we set up a clinic that we call the optimal clinic that is run by us in the division of pulmonary uh, because many of the patients are coming with shortness of breath or had prior pneumonia in the setting of their COVID, and that's kind of our starting point. We do a, a comprehensive evaluation and we work similarly with collaborating colleagues in cardiology, neurology, psychiatry, across the different divisions, trying to individualize the support for each person that we meet and make sure that we're um, able to rise to whatever symptoms they're coming with and, and work them up appropriately. Um, our experience, we've seen several hundred patients uh, who are recovering from COVID in our clinic. And I think one thing that I wanna, you know, kind of elaborate on my prior um, definition about and also to make clear in why I think this multidisciplinary approach is so important is that people can have persistent symptoms after COVID or any other kind of viral infection that can last for a long time. And we want to be very, you know, uh, careful in identifying what the cause of these symptoms are and not just attributing any ongoing symptoms to coronavirus and at the expense of overlooking other potential medical diagnoses or other conditions that are causing these. And for example, when I'm approaching a person who has taken more than two or three months to recover from coronavirus and has persistent symptoms, I kind of have a, a set of questions that I go through, and that's what my colleagues and I are all doing. And we're first asking, does this person have evidence of organ damage, something that happened to their heart, their lungs, as a consequence of their acute COVID infection? If so, then they're having a post-COVID condition. They're having a detrimental impact on their life because of COVID, but I wouldn't say they had long COVID. I would say they have lung scarring from prior pneumonia, or they have a cardiomyopathy, a problem in their heart, but they have a specific identifiable diagnosis that we can name and we can extract from other treatments to describe how to treat. If they come after a complex hospitalization, and I know that they had changes in their cognition, delirium during that, if they lost muscle strength or lost um, the coordination to do some of their activities of daily living, I would say that they're experiencing a post-hospital syndrome or a post-intensive care syndrome 
related to their COVID-19 infection. And I kind of think about a third category of patients who have neither the organ dysfunction nor the sequelae of being in the hospital as being those patients who are most what are often referred to in the media as having long COVID or long haul symptoms. So they, I try to apply that term only to people where we can't make another more specific diagnosis based on the testing that's available. And I think that's where comprehensive evaluations at centers like ours and like what you're describing at Stanford, Dr. Bonilla, are important because we don't want to just assume that any symptoms are related to long haul COVID if we can identify another cause. And I will say we found things like cancer, we found blood clots, we found anemia, hypothyroidism, all sorts of diagnoses that can explain symptoms that were presented to us as long COVID, but we found an alternative cause. And that's why I think this kind of comprehensive evaluation is so important. Thank you. So at, at the risk of stating the obvious uh, to Ms. Huff, it, it sounds complex. It sounds complicated. It sounds multidisciplinary. Uh, these two institutions have taken a, what I'll call a coordinated clinical approach to this. Uh, Ms. Huff, what's your observation or experience about whether or not that is the emerging trend or whether or not uh, various institutions are choosing to deal with it more on a sort of, I'll call it a case by case symptom set, symptom set basis. Uh, I may not have used the right medical terminology, but I hope you understand what I was asking. Yeah, so I, I think um, we are seeing a, a multidisciplinary approach as being the sort of preferred um, model, if you like, of setting up uh, COVID clinics or, or COVID services. And I think what Dr. Block was describing is, is really key around um, you know, when people are engaging first through primary care or in, in, in hospital, thinking about any um, underlying condition that might also be there as well. And I know uh, from my time in the NHS, that's been a really important thing for us to consider there as well, when people are coming forward and talking to their primary care clinician, which is often the first point of contact in, in the NHS. You know, people during COVID uh, didn't always come forward if they had a um, an, an issue because of, of concerns around, um, you know, being out and about. And so it's really important that, um, that, that the right uh, research is done around that individual to make sure that it is long COVID rather than something else. And I think what's been described around the multidisciplinary engagement is, is really key. Um, and one of the other things to consider is that um, it's not just having an impact on people's health. There's um, limited research around long COVID at the moment, and, and we're hoping to do more, but it, it, uh, there is evidence to suggest that this is having a serious impact on how people are able to live their lives. So I think that's an important part of um, supporting people through, uh, through this process as well. Thank you. So let me ask both physicians, uh, and either one of you can begin. Um, how concerned should members of the public be? We've spent a year and a half with folks trying to wrap their arms around the pandemic, the notion of COVID. How serious is it? How serious is it not? You'll remember the debates early on about is this, quote, just a bad cold or like getting the flu. Uh, and now I think people have, uh, you know, come to their own conclusions based on um, the very painful history of the last year and a half. But with long COVID, um, you know, how, how serious are these lasting uh, effects and symptoms uh, after that 12 week timeline, if we were to use that? Dr. Block, Dr. Bonilla, either one of you. I think so I seen the uh, the real case Dr. Blob mentioned the post COVID uh, patients and some of them they have a very incapacitated the cognition compromised the autonomy dysfunctions are the major things we can see some people experience shortness of breath and tachycardia and the workup have been complete negative in those kind of population maybe we don't have the right tools to go further but this is the, the population that we see. And many people have to stop working. Many people, they are more to functions, not able to concentrate. So it's something like it's a real problem. And one of the concerns that we have is what happened with a healthy younger populations. People getting infected, 
babies getting infected, kids getting infected. They say nothing happened to them. We don't know the future. We need to see what happened in five, 10 years from now, what happened with those kids in the school, what happened in college, and what happened in high school. So it's very important we take this condition very serious because the implications in for the populations are very uh, devastated. Um, and this is one study done in soccer players because supposed to be stronger, healthy people. This was done for two teams, the team from the, Ita the Italians and the Germans. And they look at how many people they get COVID and they, and they want to see what happened to them after COVID and the performance. And they found they declined the performance in the, in the soccer games. So if this happened to a healthy young population, we don't know what happened to a regular worker. And unfortunately, this disease has been impacted more the underprivileged people, the people that are not able to afford a place to stay. They live in a house with a multiple families in the same house. The transmission in this population is very high. So they are the population that, that have been kind of neglected. And this kind of COVID brought to us this kind of the disparity between the very rich, rich and the very, very, very poor people. So it's something like a, it's going to be a long-term high implication. This disease is not going to abandon us. We're going to see the sequela, the sequela for the society and the scar from this illness into our society. Dr. Block, your, co your comments, your thoughts? Yeah, I think you encapsulated a lot of my concerns very well. I think, you know, we've... Uh, as a country and as a world, you know, been very focused on mortality with COVID and I think appropriately so. And I'm joining you from our COVID intensive care unit where we're still seeing people who are having, you know, devastating acute COVID-19 infection. But, you know, we've had, you know, 600,000 deaths of COVID now in the US. Um, we've had probably 125 million infections. And so if we're talking about a condition that's gonna offer affect 10 to 20 percent of those who have survived COVID. We're talking about 15 to 25 million people right now in the United States who are potentially going to be coping with syndromes of uh, ongoing COVID. And so the, the number is very large. And then I also share Dr. Bonilla's concern, whereas, you know, the mortality has mostly been in older adults and then um, across populations as well. You know, the group that seems most at risk to have long haul type symptoms from COVID tends to be younger working age adults. And so I think appropriately, this has led the medical community, it's led people who work in disability to think and thinking about um, disability claims to acknowledge that we could be facing a wave of people that are facing maybe decades of reduced quality of life and productivity. And so I think both based on the magnitude, the absolute number of people affected, and then also based on the fact that we could be talking about persistent symptoms in some people who impact the remainder of their lives. Um, those are major areas of concern. And I think, you know, when I'm talking to people who are not as concerned about their own risk for mortality, for dying from COVID, um, I would point out that we don't know that they're protected from developing long COVID, and they could be in that 10 to 20% who have even a mild infection on the upfront side and then go on to develop persistent symptoms. So I think that is a very good reason for people to be uh, motive, an extra motivator to go ahead and get protected with vaccination. Is there something that people can do to prevent uh, long COVID if they have in fact, been diagnosed with COVID, Dr. Benia or Dr. Block. I, I, I mean, we earlier uh, talked about the the very uh, sort of basic front front end consideration, which is one way to avoid long COVID is to avoid COVID, which means get yourself vaccinated. Uh, but let's say somebody comes down with COVID, uh, is there something they can do as they are? responding to the initial COVID uh, infection to protect themselves or mitigate the impacts of long COVID? Do we know, Dr. Block? Sure. So, 
First of all, on the vaccine fund, I do want to say that there is data from trials. There's two that I'm aware of that show that the risk of having persistent symptoms at six weeks or beyond is lower if you're vaccinated. So even if you're vaccinated and have a breakthrough infection, it seems like you're less likely to go on to develop long COVID. So that's just to underscore the protection of vaccines. And then I would return to kind of my mental model for how I think about people with persistent COVID. Now, once you've had COVID infection, and you've documented COVID, you're actively infected, and you're trying to figure out how can I reduce my risk of having persistent symptoms in the long haul. That's why I think it's really important to try to reduce the disease severity on the upfront, because it may be that you could have mild illness and still go on to develop persistent symptoms. But what I would hope to avoid was progression of your illness where you become more sick, and then you're at risk of developing organ damage if you have a severe pneumonia or other organs that are affected. Dr. So on Black. that front, I think it's really important for people to, early after their diagnosis, be in touch with their primary care doctor or whoever their primary health care clinician is. Um, ask about whether they're a candidate for treatment like monoclonal antibody therapy or otherwise make sure that they're plugged into care to try to reduce the risk of pro progressing to severe disease. We have this new oral medication that's just been announced in the last month that might offer an opportunity for people to take an oral treatment for COVID and reduce their risk of progressing to become as sick. Very similar to what we have, for example, with Tamiflu for influenza infection. So my hope would be that that will soon also become a means of mitigating the risk of developing more severe illness on the front end and therefore reducing the risk of having persistent dysfunction on the back end. So I'm going to try and take the uh, very good medical explanation you gave and put it in layman's terms. The way to avoid a bad case of long COVID is if you've got COVID, do everything you can as fast as you can to mitigate the adverse impacts of the initial onset of COVID. Did I get that right? Yes, and that should help reduce your risk of certain forms of ongoing symptoms, but it may not offer complete protection against the fact that even a mild acute infection can go on to the, uh, lead to persistent symptoms. Dr. Bonilla, what else, if anything, would you add to that uh, regarding the ability to try and, quote, prevent uh, the onset of long COVID or its symptoms? I think I want to just the, make emphasis on what Dr. Block just mentioned. The most important thing to prevent long COVID is prevent COVID. And the way we can prevent COVID is try to want to get vaccinated. Possible therapeutics try to prevent the progression of the illness. And the other one, looking for the risk factors. We see people develop a long COVID, are people obesity? It's one of the problems that we have in this country. And we are already overlooked how the uh, industry of fast food have been created a problem. If we have a less obese people, maybe we have a less people in ICU and less people die, control hypertension and control diabetes, because they are the things that we see more frequently in this country that can be intervened ahead of time, try to bear complications, not only for COVID, but other conditions that we see every day in our practice. So the important thing here is prevention, prevention, preventions, and getting vaccinated and possible therapeutics in try to uh, intervene early in the disease, try to prevent the progression to long COVID. Thank you. And Ms. Huff, uh, coming back to these systems issues that um, are so important to our response uh, at the governmental level and certainly in the public health arena, what does all this say about um, the impacts of long COVID uh, sort of beyond the immediate health concerns, uh, you know, in terms of the ability of our systems to respond. Yeah, so this, um, I would say to date, a lot of the research that's been undertaken around long COVID has very much focused on the clinical symptoms that underpin it, um, creating a definition for it and thinking about the treatment of it as a health condition. And one of the things behind uh, Brown School of Public Health long COVID initiative is, is to try and kind of reach beyond that and start thinking about some of the, the research and the evidence um, of, of the wider impacts 
uh, that long COVID ha is having on individuals and on society as well. Um, there is some very early emerging uh, research that's indicating that perhaps up to about 40, 45% of people who have uh, had long COVID are um, returning to work with some form of adaptation or, or um, accommodation needed for them to return to work and possibly as much as up to kind of 20 percent are just struggling to return to work at all so that you know and when i say work um please take that as a, a broader account than just employment there's study within that there's students uh, as as the doctors have mentioned um there's also people struggling to complete tasks in the home you know this is having a huge impact on on some people's lives and how we coordinate support for those individuals, I think is, uh, is something that we're going to need to think about at the local level and at the national level. Um, and, and we recognize that we need more research to understand the impacts that's behind that to, to inform the policy. And I think, you know, the, the NIH investment in research and initiatives like the Brown one will hopefully help in, inform, uh, create the evidence to inform that policy development. One one last question for all of you, and then I want to turn to my colleague, uh, the very patient supervisor, Otto Lee, and let him uh, probe a bit. Um, it, you know, there was passing mention earlier, uh, Dr. Block and Dr. Bonilla, uh, to the fact that someone will, uh, as you all say, present, I would say, show up in their primary care doctor's office uh, you know, the family doctor, if they're fortunate enough to have a good family doctor uh, with these symptoms, how are you all feeling about the ability of the, the GP, the general practitioner, the family doctor, the primary care physician to recognize what they see as long COVID and send these folks in the right direction to get the help that they need? Dr. Benia? I think we have some kind of uh, criteria here for the patients when they refer to our clinic. And we want to be sure they have a COVID first and COVID invasive or AD diagnostic tools because we want to be sure there are people don't they have a having a cold and not as done and they have something that resembles chronic fatigue syndrome and then people, people come to the clinic as a post-COVID. So we have some a criteria like a test positive, one have, if the people have no test positive, maybe some symptoms can guide to the primary care physician to identify those kind of patients. Like how somebody referred having some uh, headaches, fatigue, uh, some lost sense of smells or taste, symptoms like that can guide him to consider possible have COVID. And the other thing is looking for the timing of the infection versus the timing they see the patient and see they fit into the potential criteria for COVID. If he has suspicious of something by post-COVID syndrome, it's better to refer to a, a center that they can able to evaluate those patients appropriately, try to guide them in, a, in the right directions, maybe with the right group, try to take care of their problems and not uh, dismiss them because quite frequently, Many physicians dismiss people, especially females. It is this post-COVID we see is more frequently affect females than males. And there's a tendency to dismiss the female because there's a female with many symptoms that they don't understand, doesn't mean they are not real. You don't understand, don't see it. the patients are stupid. No, it means like we need to pay attention to the patients and be sure we take care of our patient because it's our job to take care of people and try to direct that in the appropriate direction. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Block, how are you feeling about the ability of primary care physicians to sort of recognize what they see and uh, guide, uh, guide their patients in the right direction? I think it's critical, and I think that this is exactly a role that primary care, I, I would hope, is feeling comfortable stepping into, and I think it's an important way that they can serve their patients. And I say it for a couple of reasons. First, coming back to the issue of scale, right? If we're talking about tens of millions of people who are at risk for this, we don't have specialized multidisciplinary post-COVID clinics at this time that can accommodate that many people. And I think access is critically important here. We already know that this is a pandemic that has shown a spotlight on inequities in our, in our country and in our healthcare system. And so we wanna make sure that people have access to the type of treatments that they need. And doing that through a primary care doctor as a first step, I think is a great pass. 
Um, with that in mind, uh, you know, our approach is that we're trying to get out into the community and speak to local groups of primary care doctors and provide education so that people can feel comfortable uh, with the initial assessment and treatment of patients that are recovering from COVID. And on a lot of times providing reassurance that their symptoms that they're still having two, three, four weeks out um, do not mean that they necessarily have long COVID because a lot of people are very worried about that. I think the other place that we can add value is exactly what Dr. Bonilla said is I think there are patients who unfortunately have had their symptoms dismissed and they have seen multiple doctors. They've been told that there's nothing wrong with them in a dismissive way that doesn't acknowledge the experience of what they're living on a daily basis. And so I think that we, you know, in a added layer, second pass as a subspecialty clinic is we can provide some of that reassurance based on the volume and the experience that we're seeing in terms of many patients and add as that backup layer behind the primary care doctors who are playing the first role. I also think that because this is a, a disease that can affect multiple parts of the body, and that we know that there's a very strong mind-body connection and it can also have impacts on cognition and mood and mental health and well-being. I think seeing a clinician that you trust is really important for having faith in the treatment that you're getting. So if that person is a face that's familiar to you because they've been your primary care doctor for a long time, I think that therapeutic relationship could provide a lot of benefit in helping address the symptoms that people are having. Thank you. Ms. Huff, uh, you're, I'm going to give you the last word on this before I go to Supervisor Lee. I, are we, are our healthcare systems in this country set up for what I'll call this, you know, sequence of referral from uh, primary care physicians to folks who are specializing in the long COVID field? Or uh, what's your sense of this uh, in terms of the existing American healthcare system? Um, I am quite new to the American healthcare system, so I'm not entirely sure I'm qualified uh, to, to answer that question, but I would reiterate the importance of it and the importance of supporting primary care clinicians to understand this condition. Um, we've talked a bit about the importance of continued research, education, learning. I think that it's really critical that reaches out into our primary care colleagues. Um, and it's really important that we're helping them to understand what, um, what it might look like when someone turns up at their um, clinic with, with these kind of symptoms and the importance of, of not dismissing that as both um, clinicians have indicated and, um, and supporting people to um, be listened to and uh, receive treatment for the symptoms that they're experiencing. And what I would say is that the uh, support for primary care in doing that and support for coordination of the patient in their personalized experience is one of the, the core planks of, of what the NHS back in England has been focusing on and how we support people when they, they will tend to turn up to their primary care or their regular clinician. And, and often that will be in primary care um, if they don't have an underlying health condition. And I, I do think it's gonna be really important that we help those clinicians understand um, how to best support those patients in, in getting the help that they need. Um, and I think there's going to be more to do to, uh, to do that because we're still learning about long COVID. All right, thank you. Supervisor Otto Lee, uh, who's the vice chair of our committee, thank you so much for your patience with my questions and these sort of opening, uh, hopefully table setting remarks. Uh, questions uh, that you'd like to offer our panelists? Yeah, I'll throw the question out to everybody. Thank you very much uh, for this very informative uh, discussion on long COVID. Uh, certainly a very complicated and multidisciplinary issue. Um, and we certainly have all kinds of stories. For example, some says they have brain fog, some says they have uh, a loss of taste. Uh, are these the type of symptoms that we are seeing in long COVID? And if you could tell uh, and explain uh, how, how that works. And do you also see what a uh, people might have a weakening immune system uh, in terms of fighting future infections as well as are these the issues we're worrying about? So the, the, the long COVID symptoms, I think they are, if you have a definition more than, than four weeks or, or 12 weeks after the infection, here mm -hmm. the most common symptoms that have been reported one of the biggest studies came from the UK, 
Mm -hmm. Like uh, they assess close to 5,000 patients mm -hmm. who had COVID with a COVID test positive. And they found the most frequent symptoms in that population were fatigue, headache, mm -hmm. dyspnea, and anosmia. So loss of sense of smell. Mm -hmm. And they found out the older you are, the more chance to develop COVID. The high BMIs or be a female is a risk factor for this kind of problem. Mm -hmm. The other thing is interesting they found was when the patient have a day at the beginning of the infection has more than five symptoms, the risk to develop long COVID is higher. So it's in base of this kind of bigger study that we can maybe can predict maybe who's going to develop long COVID, but there are many things that we don't know, we need to learn. I think this is a, a like a, a, a story in process. Mm -hmm. Whatever we say today, tomorrow is going to be changed. Mm -hmm. um, we are learning about those people have a persistent inflammation. Even months after they recover from COVID, they find elevation of inflammatory cytokines in those kind of populations. Mm -hmm. And there's some evidence of possible is small vessels damage. The vascular should have been damaged, possible secondary for activation of the immune system, possible inflammation. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Now, you mentioned high BMI, so the, the body weight actually becomes an issue, actually. Those who are, I guess, more in the obese category or, or in the higher BMI, uh, the body mass index, right? Yes. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. so overweight is actually uh, one potential cause for having uh, a more serious long COVID issues. Yes, you're correct. I think Dr. Brock, maybe he can verify those things because what we see in ICU on the vein, they are most of the time they are obese population. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the factors that make those people more susceptible to have this kind of more severe disease and long COVID. Right. Do you see other pre-existing conditions as well, like high blood pressure um, uh, or um, um, a cholesterol level? Are those uh, affecting the higher risk of COVID as well? I think when you're looking for the happy more described more for severity of severity. acute COVID, mm -hmm. and the severity have been described people that are immunocompromised, people mm -hmm. with HIV, cancer, chemotherapy, mm -hmm. uh, patients with high doses of steroids, and um, patients with diabetes, hypertension, mm -hmm. patients with an uh, underlying lung disease, like a COPD, asthma uh, population, people with uh, chronic diseases like a cirrhosis or, or on dialysis. Those are the population that have been described associated with severity of the illness. Mm -hmm. Got it. Now, uh, one surprising uh, discovery I'm hearing today is, uh, I guess we were always expecting that the more uh, elderly people uh, would be susceptible for the long COVID, but it turns out we knew that, of course, older adults have issues with mortality. Uh, however, the longer COVID actually affects the younger working age adult, according to Dr. Block, right? And how you said there's decades of reduced quality of life potentially. That certainly, to me, is a surprise. Uh, thinking that younger people seems to be stronger, uh, the fact that they actually seem to suffer uh, or have more numbers of them suffering from long COVID, that seems to be uh, somewhat counterintuitive almost, but maybe you could elaborate that a little bit more, Dr. Block. Yeah, I think that's a great question and insight. So, you know, certainly we set up our clinic expecting to take care of people who had been in the hospital with severe COVID, which right. was going to be more older adults and people with more medical problems who are right. likely to get severe initial COVID. And we were expecting we were going to see them and take care of them after they left the hospital. And that's certainly one population we've seen. But we were also surprised by the fact that we were meeting a lot of people that did not have those medical risk factors for severe illness. People who were in their younger adulthood coming to us with persistent symptoms despite the more mild acute illness. So that certainly was something that uh, now 14, 16 months ago was a surprise to us when our COVID clinic was just getting off the ground. Uh, but I think that experience has been borne out around the country and around the world is that this is a population that's at risk. And I want to clarify one thing I said, which is we don't know how permanent these symptoms are. So I do think it's important to be clear that people are potentially at risk for many years or decades of reduced quality of life. But we're still hopeful that people won't have permanent symptoms. And we don't know simply because COVID is only a two year old disease at this point. Um, so I think that's the, the major thing that I would to clarify on that point. Thank you, Dr. Block. 
how about uh, when you say young adult, do we have any data at all with uh, even kids as well and regarding the uh, issue of long COVID? Because as we know, uh, five to 11 year olds are still not eligible to get the vaccine. Hopefully in a couple of weeks that might be, but at least for now, we know they're not. Uh, any data on, uh, on kids yet on long COVID? I'm not aware about any data in, in pediatric population. I think there are something like a, it's more uh, concerned to me is something have been described like a systemic inflammatory responses in pediatric populations. So there are kids, they're getting COVID, maybe mild COVID or maybe infected without any symptoms, test positive without symptoms. And maybe weeks later, four, six weeks, maybe two months later, develop acute febrile illness and sometimes look like a sepsis and some kids go I mean, to the hospital so in ICU and few of those kids can die from this kind of condition. So right. this is important to know. Prevention is very important. Vaccinated as soon as we can, especially in this kind of high risk groups. Try to figure out right, have your child to get this kind of problem and die because we have negligence in vaccinating your kid. So it's something like a, it's our responsibilities as a parents protect our kids. And I see in this country, people have a different kind of priorities. There seems to be, I'm not sure, sorry, sorry, it's just long COVID issues. The question is, there is this perception, and to me, I think it's a misperception, a wrong perception, that they, people think that kids have lower risk of catching COVID or have uh, less severe symptoms of it. And I'm just trying to, to explain, and of course, there's so much... Uh, chatter uh, and noise uh, in public about this issue. Uh, and maybe you could add a little bit more into your experience from the pediatric side uh, of how dangerous it is when kids don't get the vaccination when they be may become available. Let me ask a few things and I want to, to uh, block to finish here. Um, we know at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, everybody was uh, indoors. People, they not too many kids infected. Mm -hmm. We start vaccinated the elderly population. Mm -hmm. So, and then we open without vaccinating the younger population. So mm -hmm. then, then we start seeing the hospital in ICU, the younger population in pediatric units, we see more kids with this kind of problem. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, it's important to recognize the, the kids, they can have infection without any symptoms. And does it means there can be a benign illness. It's very important we uh, be aware about this kind of condition, especially uh, think about you as a parent and see what's your responsibility for your child to protect them and to get vaccinated when it's indicated. Thank you very much. And I'm glad you mentioned the fact that there are folks who are infected without symptoms and which is exactly what makes COVID so dangerous. Uh, that people would have it, carry it around, infecting other people without knowing it. And I believe I probably ran, just ran out of time, uh, Chair Samidi, I want to turn the floor back to you. Thank you very much for all those uh, uh, very uh, uh, excellent answers to my, my question. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. And let me thank Dr. Block, Dr. Benia, and Ms. Huff. Um, we're going to turn now to our second panel. Uh, and certainly we uh, welcome uh, uh, Ms. Huff and Dr. Block and Dr. Uh, Benia, if they can, and would like to stay with us if they have other duties to call them away, we understand that as well. Thank you all for being part of this. The uh, two members uh, of our board with whom you're speaking, uh, Supervisor Lee and myself, are two of the five, and ultimately we have to make decisions about the direction our county goes in dealing with these issues, and so being more fully informed by virtue of your uh, information sharing is uh, a critical part of that. So thank you again. Let me turn now to Dr. Supriya Narasimhan and uh, to Dr. Angela Suarez. Uh, doctors, thank you both for joining us. Uh, both of these uh, good folks are physicians with our Valley Medical Center, our Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, our health and hospital system. And uh, let me welcome you both and say thank you for the work you've been doing to date and uh, that you'll be doing in the future. Uh, but uh, thank you for being with us here today. I guess I would start with uh, you, Dr. Uh, Narasimhan, uh, and then go to Dr. Suarez and, and start with the question, what are we seeing here in Santa Clara County? Uh, has our experience been similar to what we just heard uh, or in some ways different or distinguishable? 
Thank you for having us. Um, it's an honor to be here. So I'm going to first um, speak as an ID specialist. So as an ID specialist, you know, we haven't been receiving a lot of referrals for long COVID in particular um, in our specialty clinic, maybe just one or two, and predominantly the symptom happens to be fatigue. Um, we're also, both Dr. Suarez and I are also part of um, the medical branch of the command center. And as an enterprise, we have not been made aware of a large number of influx of disability or requests or requests for accommodation from our healthcare workers who are who have recovered from COVID. Um, Dr. Suarez is going to talk a little bit more about a survey of her primary care physicians and what they have seen in their experience. So I will turn it over to her. Thank you, Dr. Suarez. Thank you, Dr. Suarez, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks for including primary care in the discussion. Um, currently, we don't have a clear picture on the prevalence of long COVID in our system, and that's mostly because we just recently had the ICD-10 uh, diagnosis code for long COVID added to our electronic medical record. Uh, so that just occurred on October the 1st, which makes it difficult for us to pull the number of patients that have been diagnosed with long COVID. I think up until this point, um, physicians have been using mostly the general symptoms, so shortness of breath and fatigue when seeing these patients. Um, so what we did last week was we just did a quick survey of some of our primary care providers, asking them whether they had or had not seen patients that they considered had long COVID. And of the 50 respondents that we had, about 75% said that they have seen patients with long COVID. But the number of patients are small, it's less than five per each of the respondent. Um, and of those who responded yes, only about 50% have made referrals to specialty for those patients, the highest number being to pulmonary uh, specialty service. Dr. Suarez, uh, you perhaps heard earlier, I asked a question about whether or not our primary care physicians felt well equipped to know and identify long COVID when they saw it. Do you have a reaction to that question from earlier in the conversation? Well, I believe that the primary care um, clinics in our system have been uh, managing acute COVID um, for the most part in those patients who are not hospitalized, we established the C3 clinic uh, and managed our patients through there. Uh, and so I believe that we do have some knowledge. Um, uh, the picture as you know, was stated earlier is not quite defined. And so it's, uh, I think going forward, um, we will try to educate our PCPs as much as possible. But I think that the, um, medical homes uh, that we practice in our Valley Health Centers are where our patients feel most comfortable and where they're going to present initially. Uh, and so it's very important that the PCPs are aware of the symptoms of long COVID and that we establish clear referral guidelines um, and that we have access to those specialists that uh, these patients need to see. And, uh, and this is a serious question. That, that, Sounds to me then, as a layperson, like the starting comment that you made about having a, a code in our electronic health records is, is actually more significant than it may appear at first blush because you can't call it long COVID if there's no place to call it long COVID. Did I get that right? Well, that, yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um, and then let me ask, uh, both uh, Dr. Nara Simhan and uh, you, Dr. Suarez. Uh, so given what we're seeing, how has uh, the VMC system uh, adapted to the, the, this new emerging need? What are we doing differently? How are we doing it to respond to uh, the uh, existence of something we now characterize or call long COVID? Right, so um, I'll start on that. Um, so as Dr. Suarez mentioned, we've added long COVID as an ICD-10 code to our electronic medical record system to help us with data mining going forth. Um, until then, right now we are actually working with our primary care doctors and our pulmonary colleagues to make sure that initially on diagnosis, our COVID patients have good um, 
follow up, basically anybody who's discharged from the hospital can be scheduled with their own primary care doctors in their uh, post-hospital discharge slots, which are urgent slots. And anybody who is hospitalized and doesn't have an assigned PCP is seen in, an, er, in our urgent care clinics. Um, as Dr. Suarez mentioned, there's a lot of education going around on making sure that people are aware of symptoms and the patients are educated to seek care. Um, our patients are more comfortable with their primary care doctors and their primary clinics being their sort of patient-centered care for access and referrals are generated from there. We've also confirmed that um, both cardiac and pulmonary rehabilitation is available through O'Connor Hospital for patients who have cardiopulmonary um, complaints. And ICD-10 code of long COVID is accepted and um, is um, paid for by the insurance companies as a cause for seeking cardiopulmonary rehab. So we've made sure that those referral pathways are streamlined and access is provided for our patients. Dr. Suarez, your comments or thoughts on how we have been or should be responding to the emergence of this newly characterized uh, phenomenon? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, what Dr. Nara Simmons said. Um, also, what we are finding in our primary care clinics is that for a period of time, we were offering just televisits, uh, and we're now welcoming our patients back in for face-to-face -face visits. Uh, I would think if I took a survey of my colleagues, um, we are seeing far more patients who have chronic medical conditions that are uncontrolled, and so we're working hard and fast to try and get the diabetes under control, the hypertension under control. Um, and I personally have had many patients when they come in, I you know, look at the chart and say, oh, you've had COVID. Um, and, and they'll say yes, and you know, we'll talk a little bit about that, but then you know, we have to move on to the fact that they're their weight has increased by 10 pounds. Their diabetes is, you know, now uh, A1C went from seven to 10% and their blood pressure is high because the medication has fallen off over the course of the last year. So we're very busy in primary care trying to get back on track. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think that we are aware of our patients who have been infected uh, and we are aware uh, to ask whether they have any persistent symptoms. Uh, we also have patients who are unvaccinated still at this time. And so we are um, encouraging all patients to be vaccinated and asking um, reasons for not vaccinating. And we have vaccination clinics in all of our Valley Health Centers. And so we will have our staff personally walk them to the clinic for vaccination if they agree. So we're very busy in our primary care clinics right now, but I think that you know information regarding long COVID, uh, most people are aware of, and uh, we are addressing uh, patients who have had COVID. And for both of you doctors, if I may, it, it sounds, and and please either confirm or help correct me if, if need be, it sounds as if we are taking a less clinical slash integrated approach and a more uh, symptom specific approach. Did I hear that right or no? Uh, yes, I think that uh, when patients come in, we are following up on any persistent symptoms they may be having. Dr. Nara Simhan? Yeah, I would like to add that um, for a subpopulation of patients who are recovered from COVID, specifically those that have significant pneumonia, our pulmonary clinic does provide their own follow-up. So anybody who is, um, I just want to exp expand a little bit on this. Anybody who's admitted to the intensive care unit or um, into the progressive care unit with severe COVID pneumonia, they are at higher risk of having more pulmonary fibrosis and more pulmonary potency symptoms during recovery. These patients are seen in follow-up by our pulmonary colleagues. They are assessed for symptom severity. Necessary tests are done to see how much anatomic damage there is. This might include x-rays, CT scans, pulmonary function tests, spirometry, etc. And again, um, some of these patients, especially the ICU recovered ones, mainly need long course systemic steroids, but the other modalities include um, inhaled corticosteroids as well as um, other um, format other uh, modes of rehabilitation, including pulmonary rehab. So for that subpopulation, the pulmonary clinic does provide a centralized approach. For the remainder of the symptoms, which Dr. Suarez mentioned and our prior panelists mentioned, it's, it's a broad variety. It can be, um, you know, 
brain fog, it can be shortness of breath, it can be fatigue, it can be neurologic. We're, we're allowing the primary, our primary care doctors to make the assessment about which specialty they should refer to and what that trigger should be. Got it. Thank you. And let me just ask, um, and we talked a bit with the earlier panel about this, obviously, but it, you know, what, what should we be sharing with members of the public about what they can or should be doing to address the risks of long COVID? If we believe it's a, a real thing and uh, a, a consequential thing at that, what should we be saying uh, or advising the, uh, the public uh, you know, in terms of their behavior, their, uh, their efforts to avoid the potential for long COVID? Right. Um, so to answer that, I'm actually going to borrow something you said earlier in the call, which is to prevent long COVID, you have to prevent all COVID. Um, so I think the, the beginning of prevention of long COVID starts with masking with personal protection per the public health recommendations to minimize COVID exposure. It starts with vaccination so that you prevent COVID-19. Um, vaccination prevents long COVID um, by about 50%, even if there is a breakthrough in vaccinated persons. Um, one other thing is notifying your primary care physician if you do happen to have a COVID diagnosis after you get tested. Uh, monoclonal antibody therapies are more widely available now. We still don't know if these monoclonal antibody therapies or the new pill that Dr. Block referred to, the Merck oral medication, will prevent the incidence of long COVID, but it is important to avail of therapeutics earlier on in the illness to make the maximum impact. Lastly, I would say that, you know, um, your, your primary care physician knowing that you have a diagnosis makes them more um, alert to recognizing the symptoms of long COVID when they emerge. And we need to remove stigma around this. We need to empower our patients to come and seek care when these symptoms occur. And that starts with education and um, sort of empowerment to come, come forth and seek care. So one thing we're doing is we're creating easy access through Valley Connections for all of our paneled patients, as well as our um, community health partners to refer patients to us. Thank you. Uh, let me turn to my colleague, Supervisor uh, Otto Lee, and see uh, what he has uh, in the way of questions at this time for either or both of you. Uh, and again, my thanks, uh, Dr. Narasimhan and Dr. Suarez. Yeah, thank you. So uh, one statement you just said, uh, Dr. Narasimhan, I just want to follow up on it to make sure I got it straight. Is You said that vaccination uh, of uh, against uh, COVID, those three, you know, Pfizer, uh, Moderna, or Johnson, has shown to prevent long COVID by 50% for those breakthrough cases. Um, uh, so that's that's really exciting to hear because clearly vaccination is so important, not just to avoid COVID, but even if they have a breakthrough case, right. that would pro pro potentially, we know, talk about lessening severity uh, of yep. the case, uh, preventing people from dying but also be able to prevent the long COVID by half. And, and particularly among the younger population who might think, oh, well, I'm not gonna die from this. The, right. the, the amount of disability this can potentially cause, perhaps right. that is a big driver of you know, acceptance of vaccination as well. Right, exactly. So, so we shouldn't use dying as the, uh, the measure of doing well. <laughs> we should use the fact that uh, lessening severity, preventing you go to ICU and all that, uh, or, or longer disability, uh, as, as, a, as a very important point as well. How about the um, issue regarding, uh, we, we, we earlier talked about the uh, body ma mass uh, uh, index, like the higher, higher kind of a weight uh, uh, issue is a problem. Uh, how about, and also women is being mentioned as one has more uh, long COVID issues. Um, can you maybe elaborate a little bit more about the issue regarding men versus women on it, and also how that might affect pregnancy and, and those type of issues? Okay. So one thing I would like to start with is that long COVID seems to have a, a myriad of symptoms and it affects different mm -hmm. organ systems. Right. And these symptoms, these symptoms tend to cluster in certain symptom complexes. So 
people who are obese, people who have high BMI, they tend to have more severe COVID illness. And on recovery, these patients tend to have more pulmonary symptoms that are persistent beyond recovery from the acute illness. When we talk about other symptoms of long COVID, including post-exertional malaise, fatigue, et cetera, mm -hmm. these tend to happen more often in women, typically younger women, age 25 to 50. Mm -hmm. One limitation of many of the studies that have um, published data on long COVID is that they have used Facebook groups and other support groups. And so perhaps, you know, one, one thing we do not know is, is this more of a self-selection or a reporting bias where mm -hmm. people who are younger, people who are more employed, people who are more tech savvy, people who are more more white respondents are more likely to respond to these surveys. Um, so which is why we're seeing that pattern. To mm -hmm. actually address this, um, the CDC has the study ongoing called Inspire. Mm -hmm. And what it is doing is it is at, it is looking at people who seek COVID testing and have a positive diagnosis and people who seek COVID testing and have a negative diagnosis, thereby creating a control group to right. make sure that, you know, perhaps other viral illnesses do this too. Perhaps some of this is pandemic fatigue. Perhaps some of this is related to mental strain during the pandemic. And mm -hmm. these people are followed linearly in time every three months up to 18 months to address some of these questions because it will involve other age groups as well and everything is virtual. Um, the, it, the study hopes to add a lot more clarity to our understanding of long COVID. Um, in terms of your question about pregnancy, we know that pregnancy is a risk factor for more severe COVID and pregnant patients tend to have symptoms longer, but the, the actual association for long COVID per se beyond 12 weeks or so is not known. There's simply not enough data on it. Um, I did see that you had some questions on perhaps does it get transmitted through breastfeeding? And um, right. one of the things is that long COVID is deemed to be mostly post-infectious, meaning there's continued inflammatory um, activity in the body due mm -hmm. to damage initiated by the virus. But right. the viral shedding is not present. So I'm not aware of any transmission to others, including, you know, through breast milk to the to the baby um, from a mother suffering from long COVID. Right. Now, on the other hand, when it comes to the vaccination, if the mother get the vaccines prior to giving birth, does that vaccination, you know, uh, effect actually goes toward the baby when they were born? Yes, there's actually good data on it. So um, antibodies, especially the IgG antibodies, do cross the placenta. And the CDC and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology um, have recommended very strongly that pregnant women get vaccinated as a modality to protect their unborn child. Right, because previously we have had the exact opposite hesitation saying, oh, I'm pregnant, I really don't want to get a vaccine, and I hurt the baby, the uh, when the womb so now basically it's exactly the opposite that getting vaccinated while you're because obviously they're, they're born you know they're not going to be qualified for any vaccination uh, right. even if they turn to four years old so uh so the only way to really get your baby vaccinated is when you get vaccinated while you're still pregnant uh, right. so that that turns out to be a, a good thing actually good um all right uh we we've talked about other uh, uh, uh issues relating to uh, the, 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 yeah, so, so you talk about this uh, young woman group for 25 to 50, what type of advice would you give? I mean, obviously we're not so sure if there's a control group because of uh, Facebook and self selection and all that. Uh, how, how would we message just to the public? Would you say it'd be more effective regarding the long COVID? Um, I think that, I'm sorry. No, I'll go just, ahead. Go ahead, Angela. Yeah. Just say that in the clinics, um, you know, some of the patients we're seeing who are not vaccinated are the younger patients. And so I think that, you know, making them aware that they are at risk for long COVID. Um, I think somebody on the panel previously had said that is, uh, you know, an actual, you know, is a good way to possibly convince them to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, I think uh, we've all been trying to get the message across, but with all the different uh, news sources these days and people reading different stuff, uh, has certainly it's caused a lot of trust and uh, debates, unfortunately, which is uh, uh, causing a lot of uh, folks not able to uh, to believe in the vaccination, which uh, we uh, we both mean. Uh, <laughs> uh, somebody so many has heard plenty of that every every board meeting, right, Joe? <laughs> I have indeed, indeed. Um, 
Yeah, so I think um, that that's about all the questions I have for today, but it's really uh, helpful to know the, again, uh, reiterating the importance of the vaccination of how that would help, not just for uh, avoiding COVID, but also for any type of uh, long COVID effect as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Lee. I, I wanna ask Dr. Suarez and Dr. Narasimhan to stay with us because I wanna turn to uh, both uh, Dr. Jeff Smith, our uh, county executive and uh, Paul Lorenz, uh, our head of the VMC Health and Hospital System, and ask them to weigh in a little bit on uh, two di somewhat different approaches uh, in terms of uh, trying to create essentially an, a sort of a, an integrated clinic with a multidisciplinary team uh, as somewhat distinct from uh, taking the, what I'll call sort of case by case, symptom by symptom approach to a response. It sounds like we're a little more in that latter category than the former category. Dr. Smith, uh, Mr. Lorenz, your thoughts about uh, both where we are and where we want to be six months, a year, two years from now, in terms of dealing with long COVID as a Valley Medical Center health and hospital system responsibility? Um, well, I guess I'll start. Uh, I think the main issue at this point, it has to do with the number of cases that we're identifying. Um, in the long run, um, it will certainly be uh, more advantageous to have a multi-specialty focused clinic for um, long COVID patients. At this point, I think our numbers are sufficiently small and our um, morbidity um, is um, <laughs> sufficiently small that it really doesn't make sense to have its own clinic, but it soon will be, I think. And uh, so we're prepped for that when the time is right. Uh, Paul, did you wanna add something? No, I, I would absolutely agree, um, Dr. Smith, in terms of what you stated. Um, I would also just share with the group and just reiterate that our decisions to, to open new types of multidisciplinary clinics or um, be innovative in terms of the care for our patients is directly related to uh, and informed by our physician, our medical staff in terms of what they're learning and, and what they believe would be in the best interest of our patients. Um, so as we evolve in terms of understanding long COVID and what we can do to better serve our patients, uh, we will continue to, to confer with our medical staff and then, of course, um, make any further recommendations to your board through the county executive office. Got it. Any notion, uh, Dr. Smith or Mr. Lorenz, on the timeline for something like that, or is that still sort of to be determined based on data that we will receive in the coming weeks and months and looking forward? Yeah, I don't think we can give you a timeline. As Paul said, it really depends on uh, recommendations we get from the medical staff. I would imagine that uh, the infectious disease department as well as the Department of Medicine and pulmonary and cardi uh, critical care will all be um, advocates for starting up a multidisciplinary clinic as soon as they think we have the clinical need. But in terms of actually getting it going, once we get the high sign from the medical staff, we can probably get it up and running within three or four weeks. And what should we be doing in the meantime, uh, Dr. Suarez and Dr. Narasimhan, to make sure that where the symptoms are in fact multiple in nature rather than you know, a, a single uh, set of issues that folks don't get siloed in our system or limited in their care and attention to a uh, to an individual specialty when perhaps there are two or three different symptoms? How do we make sure that folks get referred to uh, the help they need, even if it's cross-cutting in terms of specialties? 
I think as primary care providers, we are used to um, referring to the specialties that are needed by the patient. So I don't see that that would be a problem. Um, you know, we want to be able to refer to pulmonary, but maybe we also have to refer for mental health services or social services. And, you know, we do that regularly for patients now. So I don't think that that would be an issue. Got it. Dr. Smith, Mr. Lorenz, any thoughts on that same topic? I would say that um, we have a very um, competent and widespread primary care um, physician network within our three hospitals and 12 clinics. And um, we watch the referral patterns and um, the um, care needs of their clients very closely. And um, they're very good compared to national and statewide statistics about uh, visits um, and referrals when appropriate. We've facilitated our uh, consulting capacity by implementing um, telephonic electronic consultation processes so the primary care doc can get access to a specialist quickly and patient can get in to see the specialist quickly if they need to. All right. Thank you for that. Supervisor Lee, anything else on uh, this topic for this panel or Dr. Smith and Mr. Lorenz? Yeah, yes, I do. The first question actually is regarding the uh, public uh, awareness. So what we have learned today is that the young adults, in this case, uh, uh, younger women too, um, adult is very much at risk of long COVID. I, I would like to see if there's any way we could do more PSAs or getting the message out either through our website and, and purchasing uh, ads to community to let people know that this is something real and that we need to make sure that young people do not uh, believe that they, they, they won't get sick as easily or, or won't die from COVID, so therefore they don't need a vaccination. So I think there's some work we could do to make sure people understand that young adults are very susceptible to, uh, to this long COVID that we discussed in the morning. And second thing I want to mention is uh, about funding. Now that we got this ICD-10 code uh, put in, would that help us in terms of reimbursement from the federal government on, the, on providing this care so that uh, uh, when we are providing these long-term or long COVID uh, care that uh, we won't we won't get bounced out and we will be able to get these fundings re reimbursed in the future. Supervisor Lee, so any time in which we're able to appropriately document mm -hmm. the types of patients that we're seeing in the related diagnosis, mm -hmm. it does in the long run help with a reimbursement. Um, fortunately, we're an FQHC system, so you know we're cost-based reimbursed. Uh, but the ICD-9, ICD-10 coding and, and efforts around that will make a difference long-term relative to the level of reimbursement your system receives. Yeah, good, certainly. I mean, I think there's so much uh, federal funds that's supposed to be fighting COVID. So I certainly want to make sure, you know, be part of long COVID, sometimes these symptoms don't happen until months later. Uh, we certainly do not want people to then try to, that we provide the treatment and then the government says, well, this is too long after the COVID, nothing to do with it, right? We want to make sure that we're able to tie the cost and the fact that uh, this is a COVID issue that we should get reimbursed for, uh, for the patients as well, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. I believe that's about all the questions I have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Suarez and Dr. Shimhan. This was uh, excellent, thank you. Thank you. Let me uh, ask our two doctors before we wrap up this segment, uh, after I say thank you as well. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Vasquez and Dr. Narasimhan, I, I like to end these conversations, if we can, on an upbeat, positive note. <laughs> so what, uh, on this issue of long COVID, uh, much of what we've heard, of course, is a source of considerable concern. What can I ask you to share that will be uh, reassuring both for our board and for the public about the future uh, ability of our healthcare systems generally and Valley Medical Center uh, systems in particular to address long, uh, long COVID. Let me give you that open-ended question with uh, what I hope can be a, a cause for optimism as we wrap up the conversation today. 
Well, I think on my uh, end, I will say that operationally uh, over the last year and a half, we have been able to assess um, when we needed to start new programs or new um, services and have been able to do that quite effectively. Uh, we did that with testing, we did that with the C3 clinic, with monoclonal antibody vaccination. And so I think that going forward, if we continue or if we see that there is a need uh, for a multidisciplinary clinic, then we will be able to, um, to get that going. And Dr. Narasimhan, any other uh, additional comments? No, um, I was going to reiterate what Angela said is that, you know, what this pandemic has taught us is that this health system is is very capable of pivoting pretty rapidly and making making sure that the needs of the public are met and will continue to do so. Um, I think we are, you know, assessing need at this time, but if a multidisciplinary clinic is where we need to go, then I'm confident that we will get leadership buy-in to do so. And um, I'm going to I take advantage of your presence just to uh, ask as well. I know it's early days yet, but any thoughts about the um, utility of boosters in addressing long COVID? Interesting question. So um, as the boosters are still getting rolled out, we don't have that longitudinal data. But if I'm extrapolating, and this is just me, um, there has been data, at least from Pfizer, that when the Pfizer booster is given, especially to healthcare workers, the vaccine efficacy of Pfizer, which had dropped to about, I don't know, 60 something percent at six months, goes right back up to about 90 to 95 percent in all forms of infection. So if I'm extrapolating from that, if those neutralizing antibodies just take an uptick high, then it would block development of any COVID and by extension, long COVID. So I would assume that there would be a benefit. However, I don't have the data to say so yet. All right. And Dr. Suarez, uh, same question on uh, relevance of boosters to this conversation, if any. Yeah, I um, agree with uh, Dr. Uh, Narvis Simon. Uh, just you know, encourage people who are eligible for boosters to get boosters, and that's what we're doing in the clinic. So. Um, thank right. you, uh, Supervisor Lee. Thank you, Supervisor Sinidian and Dr. Smith for having us on the panel. Thank, thank you both. Uh, much appreciated. Let me say thank you not only to uh, Dr. Suarez and Dr. Narasimhan, but uh, to our earlier panel as well. Uh, we had uh, the benefit earlier of having Dr. Bach and Dr. Bonilla, as well as Ms. Huff. Uh, and I think between and among the five of you, plus uh, our county uh, executive and uh, the head of our health and hospital system, Mr. Lorenz. Um, I, I certainly feel like I have a fuller understanding of the both the challenges and the opportunities uh, that uh, we're confronted with at this point. And so I will say thank you for that. And um, we uh, will let you go back to your uh, other duties. Meantime, Supervisor Lee, you and I have the opportunity to ask now whether we have any members of the public who are in the queue uh, through the clerk's office uh, who would like to speak on this item, that is item number two, the long COVID item. So let me check and see uh, with the clerk, do we have anyone who is in the queue for this item, not for public comment, which will follow, but for this item? There are currently three requests. Great, let's ask each one of them to uh, go ahead and uh, speak uh, and uh, we'll give them up to two minutes each. Go right ahead, folks. Thank you. We will adjust the timer. Our first speaker will be Tino. I've unmuted you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Yeah, hi, fellas. Um, it's amazing to me that you can have this conversation and totally disregard the latest news surrounding Anthony Fauci, the NIH, Echo Health Alliance, in regards to long haul COVID and the fact that this virus almost certainly with the evidence provided appears to have started in a laboratory and with many criminal financial connections and lies from Fauci in Congress. In regards to outpatient treatments, the beginning protocol for outpatient treatments was basically a pat on the back, go home. If you get sick enough to get hospitalized, come on back. Okay, now 
ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine have been some just a topic that we're not allowed to talk about even though there was academic fraud by the Lancet and the third party that they used against hydroxychloroquine where the lie became the truth. They could not confirm the data. They had to retract the study. And you've seen and heard all of the smear campaigns on ivermectin going on for the past several months. Now, you heard that these doctors were talking about a pill from Merck. I've told you before, Doc, uh, Joe Semidian and Otto Lee, you were in that meeting where I mentioned the multi-billion dollar antiviral program that is being promoted by Fauci. They don't want that to be in place, even with pharma making the money off of it. And they certainly don't want to have ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine, which have similar characteristics to that drug as a cocktail therapy. They don't want that to be a part of the conversation. And they don't want that, that to be a part of the conversation until they, they've experimented on people with these vaccines, which you seem to ignore the fact that they do transmit People do transmit the virus with these shots. And if kids are getting sick more now than before, it definitely has something to do with transmission from injected people. Our next speaker is Anita. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the panel. What an exceptional group of people were pulled together today to discuss this very, very important issue. Um, I will disclose that I have a post-viral sequelae that is very similar to COVID, where PEM, post-exertional malaise, is one of the diagnostic criteria. I was thrilled to hear Dr. Narasimhan um, talk about PEM, or at least mention it in passing. And so I'd like to offer only two things from a patient perspective that I know and hope you will pass on to your first line general practitioners. And that is, first of all, the importance, the incredible importance of acknowledging to the patient that what they're experiencing is real. The uh, amount of gaslighting and, and dismissing of uh, symptomology especially because of the impact on the number of women that experience long COVID has been huge and it never hurts to reinforce this with your practitioner community. The other is the huge danger of trying to get people to go back to work and to push through the fatigue, that possibility that PEM becomes a chronic, continually and increasingly, increasingly disabling part of this disorder is huge. And the biggest danger of that is people who try, especially these people in the workplace who are at peak earning years, feeling they have to go back to work, that they have to push through, that they, if they exercise, they're going to get better. When in fact, we, are, we now know that if PEM, where PEM is a part of this disorder, that kind of exercise will in fact make you worse and may potentially permanently make you worse. I encourage you to emphasize those two issues with your general practitioner community. And thank you so much for everything that you're doing for the people of Santa Clara County on facing this separate pandemic that we are going to deal with for coming probably decades. Thank you. Our next speaker is Raina. I've unmuted you. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Excellent panel today. Uh, chronic Lyme disease, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome patients report similar symptoms as long COVID. Many researchers believe that those may be post-infectious syndromes as well. How can we help that population along with those suffering from long COVID? Uh, Stanford virologist and pathologist, Dr. Bruce Patterson, has a protocol for curing long, long COVID. He sees it as an inflammatory res response, um, just like chronic Lyme disease and fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, so I would really love to see um, somebody work on all those um, illnesses together because uh, they, they present as being very similar. Thank you so much. Thank you. That concludes our request. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you to our speakers. That takes us then to item three on our regular board agenda, which is public comment. And as I indicated earlier, public comment is that portion of our agenda set aside for non-agendized items that are properly within the jurisdiction of our committee. That would mean the Health and Hospital Committee, of course, uh, but not on today's agenda. So let me ask the clerk, do we have any uh, one in the queue for uh, general public comment? 
I do have one request. All right, we'll give that person up to three minutes. And again, for non-agendized items, go right ahead. Thank you, we'll just adjust our timer. Our first speaker will be Tino. I have unmuted you, you'll have up to three minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. So it appears that uh, we're gonna have experimental shots on ages five to 11. Everybody is being experimented on, every single person. You heard the doctors today talk about the fact that we don't have mid or long-term safety data in many regards. Now, I'm gonna shift the conversation just a little bit to some of the th things that have taken place. The CDC changed the way that death certificates are filled out back in March, 2020. It allowed for hyperinflation of the death certificates and the death counts. That is documented. I'm going to be emailing each of you along with many others, this evidence that is being used in an effort for a federal, federal grand jury. At this point, I consider both of you to be intentionally ignoring the concerns of some of your constituents. I realize that we may be in the minority, but you're not in this position to just be popular. You're supposed to ask difficult questions. Beyond the CDC changing the guidelines to the death certificates, we weren't even as a county with the public health department and Dr. Sarah Cody, even in line with the state, with how they have the guidelines to fill out these death certificates for well over a year. And that's with their loose guidelines. You have not held her accountable. She talked about the issues with the testing. She acknowledged PCR, does not tell you if you're infectious. She acknowledged that it can just mean, a positive test result can just mean that it's quite sensitive. I've, I've proven to you and shown you, Joe Simidian, I sent you the video with Dr. Fauci saying that we need to overhaul our testing strategy, but that's not gonna happen until December 31st. And when he said it, he was promoting that multi-billion dollar antiviral program sponsored by Big Pharma. He said, we need to completely overhaul, overhaul our testing strategy in order to properly diagnose and properly treat people, which means that hasn't been happening entirely up until this point in time. Now, as we move forward and the experimentation continues on, there is a concern for both the unvaccinated and the vaccinated moving forward. The vaccinated are carrying just as high of viral loads or more as those who have been unvaccinated. There has never been a problem with asymptomatic transmission up until uh, January, 2020. And many argue that it didn't exist until we started with these shots. But these shots are allowing people by, as many scientists are saying, to walk around asymptomatically where they are carrying scary loads of the viral loads. If kids are getting injured without being injected, we have to consider that. And we're entering the cold and flu season where antibody dependent enhancement and enhancement in general is a major concern for people who have been injected. We don't have the data to say otherwise. And that concludes our requests. Thank you very much. Uh, that then concludes uh, today's uh, specially noticed health and hospital committee meeting and the special hearing on long COVID and Without objection and hearing none, I will thank all of the parties and members of the public who uh, took time to speak today. And we will adjourn to our next regularly scheduled meeting, which is uh, currently scheduled for Wednesday, November the 17th at 2 p.m. Thank you all once again. And without objection, we are adjourned. Recording stopped. <laughs>